In this video, we're going to generalize topological minors to just what we call minors. And if you haven't already got a sense of it, there's clearly some kind of connection between the operations of subdivision and maybe undoing subdivision and this operation of contraction. And so we're going to make that, uh, that connection a little bit more concrete and uh, work through that now. So the topic today, graph miners. Here is one way to enter into the world of graph miners. Is to first think about this idea of topological miners, where, if you recall, we looked for a subgraph that was a subdivision of our graph. And so you could look at it in terms of contractions by, say, only contracting paths to edges. Right? You can contract a path to an edge as long as that edge is not already in the graph. So we only contract paths, and that gave us topological minors. Now, today, in this video, when we talk about minors more generally, we're going to allow arbitrary contractions. So any edges may be contracted. And you can see that in this example right here. For instance, in this case, I contracted this edge to a single vertex. And this new graph uh, is the contraction here. This is not a topological minor of the graph on the left, but it is a minor. So when we contract things, contract edges, we get a uh, minor. All right. So this is really extending or adding maybe one more tool to our set of ways that one graph can hide or be contained inside another graph. And let's go through them one by one. So we started out with the most basic one, which I've here called subset, although I guess we also, we called it subgraph. And I've only drawn one graph here. You can imagine maybe the other graph is just some subgraph that sits on top. And we wrote it like this. And we were, were borrowing this set theoretic notation because really it was a set theoretic idea. This relation held when the vertices of G were a subset of the vertices of H, and the edges of G were a subset of the edges of H. And we saw that there were many cases where really we had two different graphs, but we wanted to talk about one graph being a subgraph of the other, and we did that up to isomorphism. And in that case, we just had some injective homomorphism from the graph G into the graph H. So in this case, I have a cycle of length six, and there is an injective homomorphism from that cycle to this cube graph. There's several different ways of doing it, but you might map it to, say, this outer cycle here. Okay, And that captured the slightly more general notion of subgraph up to isomorphism. Then, when talking about topological minors, we allowed for more freedom in how we map one graph into another. You could think of this as being an injective map in the geometric realizations. That is a continuous map on the geometric realizations that's injective that also maps vertices to vertices. So for example, this vertex might map to this one, like so. And the edges map to paths. This might also be expressed in terms of some kinds of simplicial maps where there's some H prime subgraph of H that contracts to G. And this has to be a topological contraction. That's contracting the paths to edges that are not already in the graph. And now that gets us to our notion of minors which is very similar. Again, if this is G and this is H, I am going to look for a subgraph of H, 
let's call it h prime. So there's some subgraph such that I can contract that subgraph to g. In this case, that subgraph h prime might be just this part right here. So I've thrown out some of the edges, and then if I can contract this edge, I get this one. So I've drawn an arrow here only to indicate that we're finding some kind of G-like structure inside H, uh, but this is not actually a map of any kind that we've seen. It's not a graph homomorphism. It's not a continuous map. It's not a simplicial map. Okay, so that's our list of four ways to hide one graph inside another. And the last two, these minor operations, have a natural interpretation in terms of operations on the graph, that is, ways of manipulating the graph. And often they're thought of in terms of starting with some big graph, so that's the larger graph, H, and then I find a subgraph, so you can think about the process of finding a subgraph as, say, delete vertices and edges. That's taking a subgraph. And then from that subgraph down to G, I do this process of contracting paths. And for topological minors, that's always taking degree two vertices and replacing them with um, a single edge. Right, so in the end, we get down to the topological minor. And we're going to express this in notation as follows. Right, it's this kind of curly less than symbol. It's often used for partial orders like this. And we would enunciate this sentence. We would pronounce it as G is a topological minor of H. Now, in the case of minors more generally, again, we start with the big graph H. We take a subgraph, and as an operation, this is deleting things, removing vertices, removing edges. And then we end up with the minor with the last step where we contract edges. So here we're contracting edges. And we are free to contract any edges we want to get from H prime to G. And the notation for this is very similar, except the T is going to be an M. We're going to write it like this. It's just a minor of H. Okay, so it's this symbol kind of indicating that we've got some partial order. We haven't actually proven that it's a partial order, but we will. And uh, the subscript is just telling us which one it is, whether it's in terms of topological minors or minors more generally. All right. Now, I keep saying more generally. And here, this lemma that we'll prove right now, or I guess I've called it a theorem, is exactly the sense in which this is more general. And hopefully, I think this should be pretty clear. I've only given a sketch of the proof. You see, the theorem says, if G is a topological minor of H, then it's a minor of H. And another way of expressing this is to say that all topological minors are minors. And the way you would prove that is just to observe that every topological contraction as every time we contract a path to a single edge, well, that's a contraction. And so the operations match up now. So this, the operations we're allowed to do to form a topological minor, so just a subset of the operations we can do to form minors more generally. Okay, so every topological contraction is a contraction. Every topological minor is a minor. But what's really important here is that the converse doesn't hold. In the other direction, it's not true. I'll show you what I mean. Let's take a graph, and I think this is maybe the example I'm going to use most often for expressing this kind of idea. Here's a star graph with four petals, four points, I guess, if it's a star. It's S4. And it is a minor of this graph. And we know that, in fact, it's just a it's the, just the image of a contraction. I just contracted one edge. 
On the other hand, if I tried to write that it was a topological minor, that would not be true. And we know already that for topological minors, you can't increase the degree. If you look at those operations that you're allowed to do, removing vertices and edges doesn't increase the degree. And if I had a path and I replaced it with just one edge, the degrees all stay the same. And so I can't change the increase the degrees um, when I go to the minor. So this graph over here has no degree four vertices. Maximum degree is three, but here it has a degree four vertex. So we know it's not a topological minor. There's no, uh, there's no subdivision of this graph inside this one. So it's not a topological minor, but it is a minor. Okay, so the, the, get the ordering of these uh, clear in your mind, like which one is more general. All right, now I've used this notation of a partial order. And the first, well, well it's not the first, but one of the early steps you'd want to prove in order to show that it was a partial order was to show that it's transitive. That, you know, if I take a minor of a minor, that that will also be a minor. And we'll prove that here. So in this case, let's let A, B, and C be three graphs, where it happens to be the case that A is a minor of B and B is a minor of C. Breaking down, down the definition a little bit, we see that that means what? There's a B prime subgraph in B that contracts to A. And there's a C prime subgraph of C that contracts to B. Let's call that contraction F. We're going to use that one. And what we would like to say is that A is a minor of C. So this is what we want. We want A is a minor of C. And so in order to do that, we would need to find some subgraph of C that contracts to A. And the way we'll do it, in fact, is to find another subgraph of C prime that contracts to B prime. And so these will all these two will be contractions. These two are injections. So this is a subgraph. X will be a subgraph of C, and it will contract and be the composition of these two contractions to get to A. And another way of thinking about this is showing that actually B prime is a minor of C prime. And the way we'll do it, the construction is relatively straightforward. I think if you were to puzzle this out, you might spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out what exactly you were supposed to keep from C in order to be able to have this contraction. And it turns out the exact things you need to keep, what you'll, you'll set X to be, is just the pre-image of F uh, of the subgraph B prime. Right, so B prime is a subgraph of B, so we could take its pre-image and that will give us a subgraph of C prime. So, so that's contained in C prime. That's my subgraph. It satisfies this relation here. Next, we look at this contraction F, and we were just restricted to X. Right? So it was supposed to apply to all of C prime. If we take it just on just a subset, that's a restriction. And that will map X to B prime. And it is, in fact, a contraction. And the reason it's a contraction is because F is. And so you can just check that the pre-images of connected subgraphs are connected. Right? Also matters that X was defined to be exactly this pre-image. That's what guarantees that it's rejective. So minors of minors are themselves minors. We get this transitivity. And so let's write it out. We write out what we've proven, which is that this relation, this binary relation on graphs, that is the relation of being a minor, is a partial order on graphs. And there are three conditions we check for partial orders. First, that's reflexive, and that one's pretty straightforward because a graph is going to be a minor of itself because, well, the identity is a, itself a contraction. So the 
It's a subgraph of itself and it contracts to itself by the identity map. So it's a reflexive relation. Every graph is a minor of itself. Next, transitivity is what we just proved. So I'll just put a little check here. And the last one we would check is anti-symmetry. And let's be a little careful. Usually with anti-symmetry, we say that, okay, if the relation holds in both directions, then they have to be the same graph. And sameness here is going to mean isomorphic. So here we have uh, this relation here will imply that the number of vertices in A has to be less than or equal to the number of vertices in B. But this also means over here that the number of vertices in B is less than or equal to the number of vertices in A. So these two together imply that the vertices in A, the number of vertices in A, is equal to the number of vertices in B, and the same holds for the edges as well. Okay, so we know at least that they, if they have this relationship, then they have the same number of vertices and the same number of edges. It's also going to be the case that if I look, if I break apart the definition here, it's saying that in uh, this pair of maps and the subgraph B prime, so I have a subgraph of B that contracts to A, that's what it means to be a minor, the inclusion and the contraction have to be bijections. And the reason for that is if I look at it in terms of the number of vertices, if I take a subgraph, number of vertices can only go down. And I take contraction again, it can only go down again, but it must not have gone down. So it must have had the same number of vertices in both cases. And uh, th in fact, then this B prime had to be just all of B, and therefore we had a contraction in both directions, but the contraction that doesn't remove any vertices or edges is just an isomorphism. All right, so we're going to conclude that these, in fact, are isomorphic graphs. All right, so what have we done? We looked at this generalization of topological minors to this more general class, this bigger class of minors. And it gives us more freedom in how we look for certain kinds of structures within a graph. And the most powerful thing that we can do with this is to relate the structures we can find, that is the minors that a graph has or doesn't have, to other graph properties that we care about. So we've seen one example of this with topological minors. If you recall, we saw that a graph was outer planar if and only if it had no, what was it, K4 or K23 topological minors. We're going to look at similar kinds of theorems. For, in for instance, there are theorems that say a graph is planar if and only if it doesn't have certain topological minors or if it doesn't, doesn't have certain minors. They happen to be the same minors. We're going to get to those in just a couple of videos. Um, so you can define whole classes of graphs in terms of what minors or what minors are present or which ones are not present in the graph. And that's going to be a major tool for us for looking at and studying different kinds of graph properties.